NASA's new administrator, Jared Isaacman, just responded publicly to claims that Boeing's Starliner is a proven system. Boeing received $1.6 billion more than SpaceX, yet their spacecraft stranded astronauts for nine months when thrusters failed. NASA has already announced they won't use Starliner for regular crew missions anymore. So what exactly did Isaac Mann say that has the entire industry convinced Boeing's program is about to be canceled? And why is a NASA boss who personally flew SpaceX missions now calling out the system that was supposed to be safer? Let's dive right in. Here's what actually happened that changed everything. When someone claimed online that SLS and Orion are already proven while Starship is holding back Artemis, Isaac Mann didn't stay silent. His response wasn't political. He went straight to the technical problems, and that's where things got uncomfortable for traditional contractors. Let's talk about Orion first, because this is where the proven system argument falls apart. Orion started development in the early 2000s. That's over 20 years ago. It has flown exactly one mission, Artemis 1 in 2022, with no crew on board. After that flight, engineers discovered the heat shield didn't perform as predicted. The ablative material experienced unexpectedly high erosion. Trapped gases caused cracking across more than 100 locations. This wasn't minor surface damage. The heat shield protects astronauts during re-entry. When it behaves differently than your models predict, you have a serious problem. NASA's solution tells you everything about confidence levels. They didn't fix the heat shield for Artemis II. Instead, they changed the re-entry trajectory to reduce heating loads. The spacecraft will now fly a gentler profile to work around hardware uncertainty. That decision delayed Artemis II from September 2025 to April 2026. After one flight and more than two decades of development, the system still requires workarounds rather than operating within comfortable margins. Now add the cost. NASA has spent approximately $24.1 billion on Orion alone by 2024. That figure doesn't include the rocket, ground systems, or operations. $24 billion, and it still hasn't carried a single astronaut. SLS faces different problems, but they're equally difficult to defend. The rocket uses RS-25 engines originally built for the space shuttle. Each engine costs roughly $100 million. SLS throws away four of them on every launch, even though they were designed to be reused. The entire core stage, which represents hundreds of millions more in hardware, also gets discarded. When you're spending that much per flight on expendable components, the math doesn't support a sustainable lunar program. This is the context Isaac Mann was pointing to when he challenged the proven system narrative. But here's why Isaac Mann's appointment matters more than previous NASA administrators. He didn't build his career inside government agencies or through congressional relationships. He started a payment processing company as a teenager, scaled it into a billion-dollar business, and became financially independent through private industry. That puts him in a completely different position than most NASA leaders. He doesn't need government salary. He doesn't need political advancement. He doesn't owe his success to aerospace contracts. What makes this even more significant is what he did after reaching that level of wealth. In 2021, he commanded the first fully civilian orbital mission. He didn't just buy a seat. He trained seriously, accepted real responsibility, and made actual mission decisions. Then in 2024, he flew again on an even more complex mission that included the first commercial spacewalk. That required new procedures, new suits, and new operational protocols. Because of that experience, Isaac Mann understands spaceflight risks from the inside, not just through briefings and reports. This matters because he thinks more like Elon Musk than traditional NASA leadership. He focuses on outcomes, timelines, and whether systems actually work. He's also publicly known to have a working relationship with Musk and SpaceX. He's flown on their vehicles, relied on their engineering teams, and defended their approach. From his perspective, the regulatory treatment SpaceX receives often looks uneven. When Starship test flights had failures during development, investigations paused progress for months. Those were experimental vehicles designed specifically to test limits. Meanwhile, traditional programs like SLS and Orion experience multi-year delays and massive cost overruns without facing existential pressure. With Isaac Mann now leading NASA, 
Many believe SpaceX will face fewer obstacles. But there's another program that might not survive at all. Boeing Starliner. The expectation that it will be canceled isn't speculation. NASA has already stated they won't use Starliner for regular crew rotation missions. That's a death sentence for a program that was supposed to compete with SpaceX. The numbers tell a brutal story. When NASA awarded commercial crew contracts, Boeing received approximately $4.2 billion, while SpaceX got around $2.6 billion. Boeing got $1.6 billion more because they were considered the safer, more experienced choice. They were expected to fly astronauts first. Instead, they fell years behind while racking up failure after failure. The first major problem came in 2019 during Starliner's initial uncrewed test. The spacecraft was supposed to dock with the International Space Station, but never made it. A timing error caused excessive fuel burn, leaving the vehicle unable to reach its destination. Investigations later found additional software problems that could have been catastrophic during re-entry. Boeing absorbed hundreds of millions in costs to fix those issues and had to fly a second uncrewed test. That second test finally happened in 2022. The spacecraft did dock with the ISS, but the mission revealed new concerns. Engineers identified stuck oxidizer valves that had already delayed the launch by nearly a year. Several thrusters underperformed during flight, forcing real-time workarounds. The mission technically passed minimum requirements, but it didn't restore confidence. It raised more questions. Then came the crewed flight, and this is where everything collapsed. When Starliner finally launched with astronauts, multiple thrusters failed. Engineers determined the spacecraft wasn't safe to bring the crew home as planned. The astronauts who were supposed to spend a week in space ended up staying for approximately nine months. NASA had to rely on SpaceX, the company Starliner was meant to compete with, to eventually bring them back. For a vehicle that received more funding, took longer to develop, and followed a conservative design approach. This was a devastating failure. Boeing has now reported losses exceeding $1.5 billion directly related to Starliner, on top of their original fixed-price contract. The company that got the premium contract, the extra money, and the benefit of doubt has delivered a spacecraft that stranded its crew and can't be trusted for regular operations. When you combine that track record with a new NASA administrator who values outcomes over legacy relationships, the conclusion seems obvious. Starliner doesn't have a future under this leadership. What we're watching isn't just about one spacecraft or one administrator. It's about whether NASA will continue protecting programs that don't deliver or whether performance will finally matter more than political relationships. Isaac Mann's background suggests he won't tolerate the old model. He's seen what's possible when companies face real consequences for failure and real rewards for success. SpaceX proved that approach works. Boeing's Starliner proved the old approach doesn't. This is what the Isaac Mann era actually means. For years, NASA protected programs based on contractor relationships rather than results. Boeing got $1.6 billion more than SpaceX and still couldn't build a working crew vehicle. They stranded astronauts for nine months. SpaceX had to rescue them. Isaac Mann isn't a politician managing congressional favors. He's someone who flew SpaceX missions himself and knows what competent engineering delivers. When he publicly challenges proven systems that consume billions without results, that's not commentary. That's how decisions will be made now. Starliner is likely finished. NASA removed it from crew rotations. Boeing lost over $1.5 billion. The real question is whether this marks a permanent shift toward performance over politics, or if the old system finds a way to survive. What's your take? Does America need Starliner as backup even though it doesn't work? Or is it time to cut programs that can't deliver? Let me know in the comments. If you want to follow how this plays out, subscribe to Space Update 24H and hit the notification bell. The next few months will show whether NASA's culture actually changes. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. SpaceX just built a mysterious vertical structure at Massey's test site, positioned right next to the static fire stand. Experts believe it's designed to test ship-to-ship -ship refueling on the ground, with a height that perfectly matches the new refueling ports on Ship 39, the first Voyager B3 prototype. But why test docking between two starships here on Earth? Because lunar missions require orbital refueling to work, and SpaceX wants to validate the entire system before attempting it in space by mid-2026.
Could this ground-based setup be the breakthrough that finally makes moon landings possible? Let's dive right in. On December 13th, observers spotted something unusual rising at Massey's site. A massive steel frame structure mounted directly onto the existing test stand, positioned dangerously close to the flame trench. The structure features a dense grid of steel members at its base, clearly engineered for extreme loads. From different angles, it reveals a D-shaped profile from the side and a rectangular face from the front. But here's what caught everyone's attention. The upper section includes additional framing designed for pipes and interface hardware that hasn't been installed yet. What exactly is SpaceX preparing to connect? The answer started becoming clearer on December 20th when a second vertical gantry-like structure appeared nearby. Then late that same night, SpaceX moved something absolutely massive. A horizontal assembly made of multiple steel panels and beams, stacked together like a giant truss wall. The structure stood roughly 10 to 15 meters tall, so wide and heavy that SpaceX needed two self-propelled crawler vehicles, each equipped with hundreds of wheels, just to transport it under cover of darkness. This wasn't routine equipment. This was infrastructure for something fundamentally new. Now let's connect the dots. This vertical frame looks remarkably similar to the booster quick disconnect gantry at pad two, except it's been rotated into a vertical orientation specifically for the ship. Its primary function appears to support fueling, autogenous pressurization, and fluid connections during static fire tests. Combined with the ship quick disconnect V3 system already installed at Massey's, this setup allows SpaceX to test the actual physical and fluid interfaces between the ship and ground systems under realistic conditions. Why does this matter for lunar missions? Because Raptor 3 engines operate at significantly higher chamber pressures with increased propellant flow rates compared to Raptor 2. Testing these systems on the ground eliminates unknowns before committing to orbital operations. But several industry experts are proposing a far more intriguing theory. This structure could actually test ship-to-ship -ship refueling concepts right here on Earth. 